Welcome. We are excited to celebrate Black Philanthropy Month this August with all of you. We're also excited to hold the first of two panels in a series of virtual conversations. Today's conversation is about the fierce urgency of Black leadership in philanthropy. My name is Tawana Nobles and I am your host and moderator today. I am the CEO and one of four founding architects of the Black Future Co-op Fund, our state's first cooperative philanthropy created by and for Black Washingtonians to ignite generational wealth, health, and well-being. I'm also your Washington State Senator for the 28th Legislative District. Before we get started, for our guests who would like closed captioning, auto-generated captions are available on Facebook. Please turn them on in your settings. We also have ASL interpretation. One of our core principles at the Black Future Co-op Fund is our commitment to being good ancestors. As we model that, we're going to acknowledge the land upon which we are standing. This land is the unceded land of the Coast Salish people, home of the Duwamish, Suquamish, Snoqualmie tribe, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup nations. 
We also recognize that others on this call may be on different territories and want to acknowledge the importance of all lands and indigenous people who are active stewards and shapers of communities. In addition, we recognize the vital contributions, innovations, culture, and labor with which this country was built by enslaved people who were brutally taken from the continent of Africa and brought to the US, by people indigenous to this land and by other immigrants, voluntary and involuntary, trafficked or forced. We honor with gratitude their contributions and lift up their enduring spirit. Black Philanthropy Month is an inclusive opportunity to illuminate the ingenuity and transformative impact of Black generosity and encourage increased investment in Black communities. It was started by Dr. Jackie Bouvier Copeland and the Pan-African Women's Philanthropy Network in 2011 and is recognized around the world. In 2021, we worked with the governor's office and the governor, our governor Inslee, to officially proclaim August as Black Philanthropy Month in Washington. So happy Black Philanthropy Month to each and every one of you. We are proud to continue this tradition of celebrating and learning and community together with our second annual Washington Black Philanthropy Month. Organizers in our state, including leaders at the Black Future Co-op Fund, Community Foundation of Snohomish County, Cardia, Inclusive Data, Pivotal Ventures, Seattle Foundation, Seattle Seahawks, and Threshold Philanthropy have come together to support this intentional focus for our community. As organizers, our goals are to elevate Black philanthropic leaders and encourage action that moves us collectively toward Black generational prosperity and well being. We're also grateful to the generous sponsors of Washington's Black Philanthropy Month. Thank you, Black Card, Community Foundation of Snohomish County, Seattle Foundation, Seattle Seahawks, Threshold Philanthropy, and the Black Future Co op Fund. All Washingtonians can acknowledge and applaud the power of Black leadership and philanthropy and contribute toward making Black liberation real in our state. The fierce urgency is now. In today's panel discussion, we will explore what is working, the challenges we face, and how to fortify philanthropic leadership, Black philanthropic leadership in particular. As society confronts the ongoing health and economic impacts of a global pandemic, worsening climate disasters, and steady assaults on democracy and our constitutional freedoms, the fierce urgency of Black leadership and philanthropy is real. To collectively address these challenges our communities are facing today, we need a Black-centered approach to shift the philanthropic paradigm. Today, we will talk with Black leaders who have and continue to forge new pathways to self-determination in the face of persistent racism and racist structures. Moving towards shared abundance requires intentional, significant investment in Black communities. We hope that everyone will come away from today's conversation with the shared vision and drive to center Black leadership in philanthropy. Next, I'd like to welcome our panelists. Please help me in welcoming Alicia Washington. Alicia recently moved to Washington to serve as the president and CEO of the Seattle Foundation, where she is excited to execute on the foundation's blueprint for impact to advance racial and economic equity in our region. Racial justice work with community has been at the core of Alicia's work throughout her career. She moved here from Ohio, where she previously was at the George Fund Foundation, and before that, the Greater Cleveland Partnership. Welcome, Alicia. Maria Colby Wolf is the president and CEO of the Washington Women's Foundation, where she's leading efforts to re envision their grant making to be trust based and community centered. She also has experience in the nonprofit sector, having come from the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project and serving on the boards of Team Child, Rainier Valley Food Bank, 
Global Leadership Forum and Allied Arts Foundation. Maria, welcome. And please help me welcome my colleague, Shona Carter, who just joined the Black Future Co-op Fund in July as our Director of Partner Engagement and Investment. She lives in Vancouver, Washington and brings important perspectives from living and working in the Southwest, as well as 20 years of philanthropic experience, most recently with the Community Foundation for Southwest Washington. She's also deeply committed to a community-centered racial equity approach and shifting the philanthropic paradigm. Please join me in welcoming all of our incredible panelists. Put your comments in the chat, tell them welcome. Also congratulate them on their new positions for Shona and Alicia, but show some energy in the chat. Let us know that you are ready for this panel. So panelists, I just wanna thank you for being here today. Thanks for joining and sharing your stories of philanthropy. We'll start with some moderated questions and then open it up for questions from the audience. Those of you in the audience, please, as we're having this conversation, begin putting your questions in the chat. We will select a few of them at the very end that we can um, add to our um, panel questions, but stay engaged, show some love in the comments, make sure you uh, comment and react to any of the conversation, any of the comments or um, questions that you hear in today's conversation. And I am going to get us going. So we have several questions for each of you. It would be great if you could answer them with about two minutes per panelist. And so first, I'd um, like to uh, focus this question to Alicia and Maria. There have been a number of Black people and Black women in particular, including you, Alicia and Maria, who have recently stepped into leadership roles in traditional white institutions to bring about equity. What do you think is the impetus behind this wave? What do you see as the potential barriers to success? And what's needed to support Black leaders in these roles? Well, Tawana, thanks for that question. And again, thanks to the Black Future Co-op Fund for hosting just an incredible series of events for Black Philanthropy Month. I'm grateful to be in partnership and community with all of you. Um, and you asked it a question. So when I think about it in the most aspirational sense, what I want to hope is that the years and years that folks have really been um, asking philanthropy, pushing philanthropy to be more diverse, to think about how they center the experience of the communities they, try, they are hoping to serve in the leadership, in the boards of organizations, is that we're seeing the payoff of that because this has been decades in the making from a number of national reports that have looked at the diversity of boards to see the leadership within philanthropy. How do we get better over time? I think if I take a less aspirational view, I think I'm also thinking about um, kind of what we have all been experiencing since the start of 2020, since the killing of George Floyd. And I think the rush and the push by so many organizations and corporations to think about the ways in which they respond. And I think the urgency was around how do we get more folks of color, particularly Black folks at the helm of these organizations. Not necessarily a bad thing, but I think it can become a bad thing if we are not thoughtful about, to your point one, when these are organizations that have been traditionally white led and that then also implies what the culture looks like and what's embedded within that culture that speaks to a white dominated way of working and being does that set leaders of color, particularly Black leaders, up for success? Or are they in a position where they don't have the support of their boards, they don't have the support of staff or stakeholders within the community that can lead to their burnout or failure? And then we don't recognize the systems that didn't cause that. Instead, we blame the leader, right? So I think those are barriers that we have to be conscious of as organizations, as governing body of these organizations, as other stakeholders in the community of it is fantastic to have new diverse voices stepping into play, but we also have to build the infrastructure and disrupt the infrastructure to ensure they have support. Absolutely, absolutely. And I would like to just piggyback on that, uh, not only agreeing, but also saying that, that it, it's sort of a, a dual edged sword in terms of who's responsible for standing up and saying, hey, there needs to be a new way forward. I think uh, a lot of our folks who like to consider themselves allies need to really step into what that allyship means. And we have to, those of us who are, are Black people and Black women need to be able to demand that. And that is a difficult road to walk down. We've gotten really used to not demanding that we be uh, treated with the allyship that we deserve. But 
that allyship has to be more than just words. You know, it has to be an allyship that recognizes the length of time it took for us to get to this place. And that recognizes that work is still needs to be done. I know when I came on board at Washington Women's Foundation, I, when I was talking to the board, just to speak to your point, Alicia, about having a board that really backs you, I said, look, I'm coming from a place that was predominantly people of color from Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. I took off a lot of armor in that organization and I am not putting it back on. So you as my board now must go and be my armor. So when weird stuff bubbles up from a white culture that has been part of the organization for decades, I'm not going to be the one who's going to address it. You are going to address it. And my board, God bless them, stood up and said, okay, we understand that that's what we need to do. They'd done the work. They had done the work prior to my arrival prior to my arrival to say, yes, we know that we're going to have a different situation and we're going to have to be able to recognize when things are not just uh, people having difficulties, but people actually needing to address their own uh, racism and their own feelings from people of color. And so that was uh, really important for me to say, and it was really vital that we have a board and allies that said, yes, we understand that the work is on us to make sure that the path for these uh, folks coming into these organizations is as smooth as we can make it. Um, yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate you all being just upfront about the time that's necessary for change, that we cannot carry that burden, that we need our allies, dominant culture um, to step up and play their role. Um, Shona, you also came from a traditional white-led institution. What are some of the challenges you faced and how did you overcome them and create the support you needed? Yes, thank you, Twana. And thank you for having me on this panel with these uh, prestigious uh, colleagues. Um, I just wanted to echo a lot of what Alicia and Maria said. Um, in my organization, like Mar Maria, I came also from a, um, the Bay Area to community foundations there that were extremely diverse, um, had equity-centered uh, um, philanthropy practices. And so coming into Clark County, which was a little bit much, a little bit conservative, um, and a board and staff that really hadn't done and initiated that, um, that work before I, I arrived, it was a challenge. It was, I faced challenges, maybe even some microaggressions, maybe even some isolation. And I really looked to the community that we were supporting to build out support systems. And I think that that was very helpful to me. I think many um, BIPOC community members, uh, organizations really were happy to see representation at the, at the foundation. And so they really leaned in and supported um, me in the work. I also um, initiated the recruitment of our first black board member and that led to additional support in the work overall. Um, I was the only black person for quite some time. So those type of support systems were really extremely important. We started a, uh, a black women's leadership uh, affinity group and this was with other black women outside of philanthropy but including um, our growing diversity within our staff, including our staff folks as well. So um, folks that were at Clark College, that were at uh, uh, Clark County, um, that were at the city, that were other, uh, at other Black-led organizations participated in this affinity group that met and we just talked about the things that we were all experiencing in different institutions. And so that was a really great way to work through and problem solve and also network and actually bring the, that type of voice into the foundation, that community led voice into the foundation. Um, we also, um, I also helped co-create uh, um, Southwest Washington Equity Coalition, which did a series of learnings um, for the community, but specifically for our board and our staff around equitable practices in, in the workplace um, around what um, equity even means for some people who are just starting their journey. So these different, you know, um, groups of, of folks coming together, supporting each other outside of philanthropy when you're the only voice inside of an organization trying to initiate change were super, super useful for me. And it's not easy at community foundations because, you know, they do have a donor base that is 
you know, based on um, a fee. And so they, they, they were very cautious about walking into this, this space of equity. And uh, I think that they were very fearful of, of that, that fee base leaving because the narrative they were fighting more nationally was that, you know, equity centered focus was taking something away, but you can't really omit, omit equity centered um, practices in philanthropy. It's all about philanthropy in and of itself is love of human and humanity. Um, and so you can't omit, you know, brown and black people in, in this work. Great, great points. I hope everyone watching has their pen and pad or is finding another way to take notes if you're not able to write them because you all are sharing incredible gems. And I know I have lots of colleagues who are still currently um, in the types of institutions that we are describing and trying to figure out how to take those necessary steps to move their organization forward so that their practices match their proclamations for racial equity. Um, so just thank you all for your expertise on um, this topic. Now, I want to move to just some more general questions um, and talk about philanthropy. We know that traditional philanthropy has only invested 1.8% in Black-led organizations, shamefully. Why is it important to have Black leadership at the forefront of conversations about investing in Black communities? And I will leave this open to any of you who would like to answer. You can simply unmute and chime in. But why is it important to have Black leadership at the forefront of conversations about investing in Black communities? I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I think what we what we have come to value about diversity and i think we kind of agree around the broader narrative is that diverse perspective and thought and experience when you bring that all around the table we get better results than just taking a homogenous view to what we are trying to accomplish in this world whether that's business or nonprofit or philanthropy or whatever it is so it's the same simplistic thought in my mind that if we want to be of greater service to Black communities, it is important for folks to see themselves reflected in the leadership of the institutions that have the wealth or the proximity to wealth, right, to invest in meaningful ways. Black people are not a monolith, right, so you can't just select one and think you got the whole thing solved, right? We have a rich, diverse community within and of itself. Um, but the more we are thoughtful about ensuring that that representation is there, we bring a different frame and lens to this work to move in ways that, you know, other folks may just not have been as conscious to think about it because it's not the experience they've come from, right? And I think this is um, kind of shameless plug, but it's an opportunity to shout out one of my staff, Jonathan Cunningham, who has done incredible work with Seattle Foundation around incredible initiatives like the Black Joy and Wellness Fund, recognizing that movement leaders, particularly Black movement leaders, the work is hard, people get tired. So how do we invest in their rest, in their care, their well-being, right? Or repair, which has been an effort to center reparations as a conversation within Seattle Foundation about how do we owe investment to Black communities in the greater Seattle region, whether it's through supplier diversity and the ways that we invest in Black businesses to grant making and other means, right? It takes that kind of view and lens to think about how that work is implemented. But back to the first point, it takes allies, right? So for my leadership of community programs who are um, majority white women to be allies to someone like a Jonathan to give him the space and the creativity and the support to push that type of work along, right? So it's still the importance of the, the frame, but again, that importance of the allyship and protection to ensure that this kind of work can move forward, especially when we're talking about um, organizations that have traditionally been white led. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the allies have to also step and realize that what what gets created when Black people are at the helm and doing for their own community might look really different than the way in which they think philanthropy is supposed to work. And Definitely. that's something that we're seeing ourselves, right? That when we put, we put a group of Black women together to make decisions about how to fit a spend a fund that was in support of Black women. And what they came up with is not what I think was originally, you know, sort of envisioned by uh, the predominantly white women in the organization. And allies have to say, okay, we don't know. They have to be able to recognize their own, 
their own ignorance in the face of the fact that this is not their community and and they can learn and discover new ways to go forward that can be more effective if they listen to those who are closest. And I also would like to add to what Maria and Alicia were saying around, you know, representation, because I think also if if we are disproportionately as black people experiencing health inequities or not having equitable access to education, it's likely that those leaders have experienced all of those things as well. I know it's true for me. I grew up uh, uh, underhoused and in poverty. And I also, you know, had some health inequities um, in my family or seeing some health inequities in my family. So I think that you have to trust that if these are some of the things that we're trying to solve in community, we have the lived experience to know what approaches might work for our community and for um, other communities as well. So I think that representation is more than just you know, um, just having a person of color or a black person, you know, within the organization, it's recognizing mm -hmm. that their lived experiences might be useful to, you know, solving some of the issues in, in the community. Thank you. And as we continue to lift up trust-based philanthropy, community center approaches, advancing racial equity or racial justice as important values or core principles, and you've all mentioned these in your work, can we continue to talk about what this means, what does this look like and feel like? Can you share just more examples around the importance of trust-based philanthropy and community-centered approaches that focus on advancing racial equity and racial justice as we continue to do this work collectively? And anyone can respond. Well, I think that we've certainly been diving into trust-based philanthropy um, at Washington Women's Foundation. And that road is not a as easy as we think it might be, in large part because of that distrust that has arisen between perhaps a, a trust that should have been there all along and wasn't uh, toward of the funder towards those that they were funding, and and then right back at them, the fundees not trusting the funders particularly to understand the real situation on the ground, and opening up those doors of trust has to start with the the folks who have the power which means you have to convince the people with the power that they're going to have to not follow up on reports. You know, we changed our whole grant process to stop doing reporting after a grant was given, to have it be all unrestricted giving, to uh, eliminate the proposal stage and have a conversation that our, our members had to just sort of listen to what these organizations were saying and listen to what predominantly at this point we've, we've focused on race equity, but black and brown people were saying about what they needed and then just trust that they knew better. And that has been, we're, we're getting there, but it has definitely been a, a long road. And one that, that um, is difficult, but also once you get there, it's so much better. Like it's easier. <laughs> It's easier to do trust-based philanthropy than it is to not do trust-based philanthropy. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that are always so surprising to me is that often these ideas that we put forth as like new ways of going forward are in fact easier on everybody. But just like that idea that, that racism doesn't just hurt black people, although obviously that certainly is where most of the harms lies, but it also hurts those who are racist, that they eliminate things for themselves or make more work for themselves by not having trust in the basis of the work that they do. So we certainly see that in practice uh, as we started to adopt some of these new practices. I think um, to, that that's perfect, but I, I also like to add that I think, you know, ph philanthropy and foundations are always so mysterious to nonprofits and, and the folks that are on the ground. And I think being more transparent and, and bringing folks into the foundation's processes, for instance, having committees where their work is important and informs our strategies and that we're not just internally just sitting around a table making decisions about the approach to community without bringing community into the foundations to inform strategy. So I think that that learning and engagement is super important. And then also compensation for their knowledge and not be exploitive. I see. I think that that starts to build, you know, that trust that okay, I've been a part of the process, and so I know that they are really trying to work alongside us as partners in community to solve some of these challenges. So, 
Um, mm -hmm. Transparency is so key. And I think those donor advised funds, again, uh, those are, they can be beautiful tools if you can, if you can move resources alongside community informed strategies, but it, it is really initially created as a gatekeeping uh, from uh, those resources in solving the problem. And so I, I really believe in opening up, um, you know, foundations and, strat and approaches to strategies to the community and have it community informed. Yeah, and I think that's, that's important when you look at it from different um, levels within an organization, particularly a foundation, right? So just to add to what you guys are saying, you know, if I were to kind of capture all of what Maria and Shona just brought to that question, the thing that I say consistently and thinking about my work here, but also thought about it in Cleveland, Ohio, is around being in right relationship with the community, right? And that's imperfect, right? It's never a perfect thing. It's always we're perfecting it, right? And it's bi-directional, right? So there are things that we need from community and how community is accountable with us as we also are being accountable to community and being open, being transparent, all the things that are described. And we will fight, we will go edit, we will have our moments. But I think if we are building that foundation of trust and candor and honesty, even if we disagree, we are doing it from a place of trust and care and respect for what we're both bringing to the table, right? So from uh, resident participatory models to the ways in which we ease um, grant requirements or um, evaluation documents, like these are all the things that we can do. I know also from experience, and I know you, you ladies know as well, that we're kind of sitting now as the CEOs of organizations, but when we've been levels down within the foundation, that transparency that Shona talked about is so important because we're advocates at that point, right? We have to understand how to take what we see happening in the community and a request that's gonna come to us and then move it through the process that we experience as grant makers to get to an actual trend going to an organization, right? And that's a part of demystifying it. I don't just make a decision on my own that I'm gonna write a grant to an organization. I gotta clear it with leadership. I gotta get it past the board, right? So there's a whole process. So it's like, you gotta help me help you, right? Like, so that's where the bi-directional part of that relationship comes in. Of, I can be an advocate, but you gotta help me with these things. And I will open up and be honest and bring you in because I, I believe in shifting that power because you know what you need and you see the opportunities on the ground. How do I create the space for that to happen, right? So even with donor advised funds, the thing that we're pushing more into at the Seattle Foundation is how do we break down the barrier here a bit and start to host kind of conversations between the organizations that we fund with our fund holders so they can just start to hear directly from folks that are doing the work about how they're doing the work, right? And they can engage in discussions with each other so our fund holders learn and know how to invest and our grantees get access, right? Beyond just the grant dollars we can move as a team. Right. Thank you. I have a couple of more questions, but want to remind the audience that we want to hear from you as we are having this panel conversation. Please let us know what questions come to mind for you. Maybe you're an ally, maybe you are working in a philanthropic organization or thinking about it, or just trying to build um, your own foundation or nonprofit and you're looking for advice, we have the experts here. So please ask your questions about black leadership and philanthropy or um, put in a chat any of your wonders. Also, while we're taking a quick beat here, folks have joined the conversation um, since we began. So if there were nuggets of information that you picked up, please drop that in the chat. Help folks to get caught up on our conversation, but put some of your learnings in the chat so folks can know what we discussed, what stood out to you. Um, I want to ask my next question, and we've kind of jumped into it, but I just want to pause and be more direct. We've already started to give some strategies and some advice for others in philanthropy, for folks who are working in foundations or donor advised um, fund holders. But I want us to repeat maybe some of what has been stated or maybe there's more messaging that you would love to get across. Um, so I'm gonna ask the question, you can repeat anything you've already stated but because we're gonna speak directly um, to those in, in philanthropy or at foundations. But what is your advice for those in philanthropy, for those at foundations, for those um, donor advised fund holders, those in corporate social responsibility, what's your advice to implement a trust-based community-centered racial equity approach? Again, you can reiterate a point you already made. Maybe there's something new that you have been just dying to really get out there and communicate. 
in, ad in addition to that advice, what are the steps that they can take to be more pro-Black organizations? And anyone can respond. I mean, I have thoughts, but I'm trying not to go first. I know. I'm like, okay. <laughs> fine, I'll go first. Okay. Um, um, I think one of the one of the things that frustrated me when I used to be on the other side of that that foundation power line was uh, that so many donors and funders would come in and and sort of already know what the solution was to the problem and then want to grant in that way. Like, oh, we think that these children need this and so here is the money for that and how can we help your organization do that? And I think my biggest advice to foundations, funders, donors, all those folks who would like to be part of making the world a better place but perhaps don't have the, the proximity to the, the, the difficulties to actually know maybe what the best option is, I so strongly encourage you to start your conversation about these changes you'd like to see made uh, from a place of curiosity instead of a place of already feeling like you know what what the issues are. You know, when we we did school to prison pipeline funding, we funded um, in uh, solutions to the school to prison pipeline this past year, and we did what we called school to prison pipeline 101 for our members who all donate into the fund to give out our, uh, our dollars. And I think most of our members had felt like they knew what that was, what the school to prison pipeline was and how it worked. But one 15 minutes into that, that 101 and 102, it was pretty obvious that a lot of them did not. And they admitted it. They said, I, I thought I knew what we were talking about. And I didn't. It was a really humbling moment, but going into these questions with curiosity instead of arrogance <laughs> means that you can get closer to really solving some problems. You can you, you approach it with a sense of grace and a sense of, of wonder and interest in how can we be supportive? How can we really help you uh, do what needs to be done? And you gotta let go of being in, in control of those dollars. They're not mm -hmm. yours. You have to also look at how you got them, but they're not yours because you're giving it to somebody else. Like there's a couple of ways you can think of it as not being yours, but once you give it away, it's somebody else's to do with. Yes. And they, what your job is to just find out the questions and then help somebody else do the answers because you may not have them. So that would be my biggest, I talk about arrogance a lot and humility. And yes. I think a lot of funders need to walk that road a little bit. Yes, I, I think one of the the most effective, and Alicia touched on this, and Maria, you're talking about it as well, is the donor education series that um, the San Francisco Foundation, when I was there, we would hold. And at a certain point, as we engage donors, you know, um, to come and have conversation with community folks who are working on these issues in community, I think they became amplifiers. And we push them to host and network with their folks who have wealth um, and, and talk about these, these, these topics with their, you know, their, their peers and their network. Um, we would encourage and support them in holding salons in their own homes and inviting people to the table. Um, they pay a, a fee at a foundation, that's the business model. So this education series they should take advantage of and then become amplifiers of you know uh, important strategies that are, I think are that are effective in community. So, yeah, education, humility, curiosity, all of those things, um, and then be amplifiers um, in, of the work and the, the those strategies. Yeah, I'm gonna underscore the humility thing. I mean, I think I would just say it more bluntly in the sense of like we got to kill it with the superiority complex, the white savior complex, right? Like that's that just creates more harm than anything that we think that we're trying to do at the end of the day. Never will I walk into um, the Latinx community or the indigenous community thinking that I know everything because right. there are cultural nuances. There are ways that you show up. There are, there's a history there, right? That like, I need to sit and humble myself and learn, right? Because in that learning, in that listening, there's gonna be the building of knowledge and partnership and relationship that I will then know how to invest. So it's the same, right? When you think about, particularly for 
folks with influence or, or in philanthropy or wealth that are white when they engage with our community, you got to do the same. Or one of my biggest pet peeves, having been in this field for a little bit, as a grant maker, is just watching how white colleagues showed up and talked to organizations that are led by folks of color. Check yourself. Are you causing more harm in the way that you're interrogating the organization about their grant requests, about their operations? Or to your point, Maria, are you learning, right? Are you approaching it with curiosity? It's the first step, like it's manners, right? It's the stuff we learned in kindergarten. It's the stuff that our elders and our parents taught us, right? Show respect to others, build the relationship that way. That's the basic thing. Um, but I'd be remiss if we also don't take the internal view on this. And I think, Tawana, this gets to your question about the, um, the pathway to being a pro-Black organization, right? Which there's been a lot of interesting um, work being developed and exploration around that. Nonprofit Quarterly did a fantastic piece in one of its last, uh, magazines to really spell this out from a number of different Black leaders about what this is. Like, what are our policies from an HR standpoint to the vendors we work with for those of us that are have assets under management, who's managing those assets, right? What screens do we use to determine where we invest? These are other ways from an internal standpoint to kind of walk the talk, so to speak, um, and think about the ways that if we are addressing the needs of Black women on staff, right? And other folks of color on staff or folks from the LGBTQ plus community, right? If we are building policies and systems in a way within our organizations to be supportive of those folks, then all of us win at the end of the day. But I think we have to be mindful of, this isn't just about how we try to show up externally and do things in the world. It's about our own mm -hmm. practices internally mm -hmm. as well. And I think we all have work to do and know that we can go further in how we show up that way. And the and to that's spot on. The, and the best way to do that is to actually hire a person to actually that is their job is to ensure yeah. that we have you know dedicate some dollars to a position where you're actually making sure that you are staying on track around these very equity equity centered approaches to philanthropy um, and trust based philanthropy. It's transformative. You know, it's transformative for all kinds of aspects of philanthropy, but you hire somebody, I just I underscore that, you hire somebody whose whole job is just to focus on that and transformations happen inside the organization mm -hmm. given, if you have given them the power to make that happen, I want to make a big old, yes. effort. if you no. have it, like, we done that, <laughs> like, yeah, we hired, and now we're done, right? So you've got to actually give them power. Right. Right? That happens. <laughs> it can be really exciting to see what happens right. in an organization. And I, I, yeah, sorry, I get really excited about that. It happened. That, you know, <laughs> I was at Team Child on the board. We did that, and we got to the place where we decided that for the next executive director, the board was not going to be the ones who made the hire. The staff would make the hire. Mm -hmm. We made that decision, which is like, which took a lot of conversation, but it was about letting go of power in all different places. You know, mm -hmm. it seeps into way more than just than just. How did we treat the black people today? It was also like, how do we actually think about power within this organization? Mm -hmm. It's exciting stuff when you dig in. Thank you all. I have a lot of really great notes and words that I have um, written down or, you know, curiosity and humility, the amplifiers, education, um, policy, vendors, um, killing a white savior complex. Um, there are a couple of questions in the comments and feel free to look over at them and we may um, be able to revisit them when we get to questions. I do have one more question for you all, but there's a great question about this pro-black mean anti-white and um, if you are interested when we get to the audience questions, would love to tackle that. And another question about supporting black youth mental well-being through economic equity, um, for example, building wealth or um, helping businesses to launch or grow. But just listening to the complexity of the issues and even the type of thought process that you all have had to go through to help to figure things, these things out in your organization, whether it's to realize that your role is to not carry these burdens and barriers on your own, but the the white leaders in white led organizations have to really lean into that and not bring on a person of color or a black person to, to lead that work, but to do their own work and hold each other accountable mm -hmm. or whether it is to um, play a, a role as a team player to give some input on these processes. At any rate, these are heavy things to, to carry. And we can't think about these things or move through this work or even elevate to where you are today 
without many, many scars. And for mm -hmm. our black sisters and brothers, they too are accumulating many, many scars. Can you share with us what you've learned, what wisdom um, you have or want to pass on to folks coming behind you? How do you move and elevate to where you are? How do you navigate through these scars? How do you deal with it? How do you deal with the trauma of being black in philanthropy and just trying to push through and do this work? Yeah, I would have to reiterate what, what I stated earlier is that you really have to kind of lean into community, support each other that way. Um, self-care is, a, I mean, I know self-care is a buzzword these days, but it is really important um, to make sure you take care of yourself. I am guilty of thinking that because I get the seat in philanthropy and that community is watching and holding me accountable, that I need to hold and manage everything. And, you know, I really kind of burnt myself out and ignored my body and made myself sick. And so now I really take that word self-care that was just kind of a buzzword in the back of my mind and meant massages to really mean rest and restore and, and listen to your body and take care of yourself and then look to your community to support each other when you're seeing it happening in other places as well, um, for sure. And I wanted to just address someone had a uh, made a statement, is pro-Black, does it mean anti-white? And I just wanted to state that like I, when I think about pro-Black, I think about um, you know, a community of folks who haven't been seen, haven't been heard, living in a, in a structure that is a white supremacist structure, really being able to, you know, amplify what it is that they are about and who they are and how to be seen and, and to also hold power in space and in community. I think pro-Black doesn't mean anti-white. It means we are here too, and we want folks to recognize that we are here in these spaces as well. Um, and that that just is a question that I think we often hear in the Black Lives Matter movement is, doesn't all Black, all lives matter? But I think when you've been left out and ignored for so long, pro-Black means we're ready to take some power as well and hold power as well. You know, I want to um, do a little bit of a spin on the question you asked, Tawana, to kind of tie back into that that question that was raised around as pro-Black being um, anti-white. And what comes to mind for me is actually just a, a quick story. So when I was in Cleveland, we spent about three years across kind of the city, across all sectors doing really in-depth kind of racial equity training for like corporations, philanthropy, nonprofits that have, you know, the whole, right? And a really great um, firm, Third Space Action Lab, which is a racial equity and justice center firm, really led that process. And one of the activities we would undertake is um, kind of describing what we liked about being Black and then what folks liked about being white, right? And so there was a lot around the cultural experience that Black folks would bring out, resilience, all of the things. Um, but then there was also a part of the exercise that talked about what we hoped for and I remember the moment when the list started to pile up of, you know, I don't want to have to ever have to worry about whether my child is going to come home, right? If they're going to get confronted by the police or if that's the last time I'm going to see them because of that encounter or challenges around kind of, um, you know, is my neighborhood safe or just all these things that I remember one of the white folks in the room saying, never even process that as something to really be worried about. And so that's the thing, right? When I think about pro-Black and when I think about like even Black joy is that to that recognition of being seen is that like I want the space just to breathe and be human right and to like laugh and be in community and love deeply right and be safe and all the things that I think it's easy to take for granted if it's not your experience I want those things so I want you to recognize that I don't have those things the way that you have them and then how do we work together to ensure that folks that look like me can have those things because when they do everything is better for all of us, right? So it's not a zero sum game. It's not this group against that group. It's about the collective space that we have and hold for each other to just be human at the end of the day and recognize the different things that make us who we are, whether it's our culture, whether it's our race, whether it's the legacy of our communities, like can we recognize that and be in community with each other? You know, I've been, I've been talking a lot about the, the fact that 
that recognition also has to come with the recognition that other people do do things differently than you do and that mm -hmm. that can be just as legitimate and that that can also be honored and that can also be joyful and that can also be and that can also matter and i i say this because what i think is really important for philanthropy for nonprofits for for a lot of these organizations and institutions to understand is that opening up the door to black people and letting them walk in the door in your institution and then expecting that nothing in that institution is going to change because look we let, we let man, everything should be fine that is not really recognizing our existence. That is saying you can come in here as long as you act just like us and nothing is different. Nothing about the way we have to operate changes. The way you have to operate will have to change. Like I don't think it's I don't think it's too much to say yeah, it will change. It will probably be easier for everybody. <laughs> in the changes that we're asking for, but they will change because what we're demanding is recognition and safety and love and all the things that Alicia was talking about and that Shona was talking about. And the systems right now are set up to deny those things to us. So you're gonna have to change the system because the systems themselves are what is preventing that from happening. And recognizing that is not anti-white. Recognition has to come Truth has to come before reconciliation. Recognition has to come before you can recognize it enough to do something about it. So when black people say that something has to change, it's not because we're saying, you know, you, you're you doing it wrong, although perhaps you are, but it is saying you should pay attention to what's happening because something is happening that is not right. And it shouldn't be incumbent on you to be liked or for you to feel nice about how the black people are treating you if what they're asking for is basic rights, I'm sorry, I get really hot about this, but this is not something that, you know, being asked, asking for basic rights is not being anti-white. If it is, then you have to examine what you think whiteness is. That's kind of what I'm doing. And being pro-black for me has been, and one of the things I've been able to do in this role is be able to really center dollars into the black community in a way that, um, has also been a joyful act. We've been able to deal with Black people making the decisions. And it has, it's been a joy of both knowing that community comes together to make the decisions and then knowing that community will be benefiting from these decisions. And that is so healing. And I think, Shana, you're right, like being in community and with your community and, depend, and reaching out and pulling them closer to you makes a huge difference in how healthy you feel when you're going on about about your work but your body will tell you if things have gone wrong and mine mm -hmm. sure did it back in the day yeah. before i started saying nope yes this weekend is not for you the weekend is for me and yeah. i know i'm not coming in and no i'm not answering the phone and putting those barriers up is so critical for us to remember that we matter we get to be joyful personally ourselves that is something that black leaders really need to remind themselves and then take the time and do it. And I, and I think that that's what, what you're saying is, is exactly the reason why I gravitated towards the Black Future Co-op Fund, because it dared to hope that, you know, we could really center ourselves in this industry and, and flip the paradigm of what philanthropy could look like uh, for mm -hmm. Black people. And so absolutely, that's what pro-Black looks like and it looks good and it feels good. <laughs> It feels great. It's such an inspiration. I, I love the Black Co-op Fund. You just, you inspire me. <laughs> you really do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I, and I think, as you all have already um, commented, there are ways to get to that feeling good and feeling great and taking care of ourselves. And I know because I have many colleagues in philanthropy who may not be sitting in positions of, of power, but who are right now taking notes or watch this replay or sitting somewhere trying to figure out how do I get to the joy because I love community and I want to see investments in community but this work is so hard and so tiring and we are extremely fortunate to be able um, to have founded and to work for um, the Black Future Co-op Fund and trying to change the philanthropic paradigm and just trying to change how we feel about mm -hmm. doing this work because we deserve to feel joy we deserve to feel joy. Um, so thank you so much for your, your comments. Um, I want to give a little bit of space to an audience question. I saw a couple, um, but I'll start with 
one, and thank you for answering um, what it means to be pro-Black and to create space um, to celebrate Blackness and to invest in, in Blackness and Black-led solutions and Black people. This question is from Carmen and Carmen asks, how can we support Black youth mental well-being through economic equity? And the examples Carmen gave are building wealth or businesses. Mm. Love to hear from um, any of you who want to respond. I think this is one of those places where when Black people are the ones making the decisions about how money should be spent in their community, it might look different than traditional philanthropy allows. And the support of Black-owned businesses, the support of putting money into the hands of Black people directly is something that looks really different than traditional philanthropy that's going through organizations and funding you know, the institutions. And um, we're about to launch a, a fund that will be giving individual black people money, black women in particular. And it is, it's just here. You need some cash because we need to build wealth. You know how you build wealth, you get wealth. You know how you get wealth, people give it to you. And that is one of the things that, that's how most of the wealth in this country was has, that's how most wealthy people exist now, right? Because they got it, they inherited it and we didn't. And so uh, looking at philanthropy through different lenses is critical to being able to address, I think, those wealth gaps. I think that's one of the things that excites me about putting black voices at the helm is that I suspect that some of our solutions are going to look a lot different than here's a nice organization for me to give money to again. And I just want to thank you, uh, Maria, for tackling that. I want to attempt to um, ask and um, not interpret, but Jackie, if you have more information about your question, please, um, you know, expand a little bit more. But Jackie asked, do the organizations on this panel, so I'm assuming that's Seattle Foundation, Washington Women's um, Foundation, Black Future Co-op Fund, do the organizations on this panel um, have this position, so someone who is focused on power already or currently working towards building this level of accountability. And I'm wondering, Jackie, you could put this in the chat, if this is a response to hiring someone to do the equity training. Are you asking, do our organizations already have someone focused on that power dynamic and, and equity? Um, but please let me know if that's not the question. And again, you can just put it in the chat if we're if you feel like we're on the right path? Do we have someone in our organizations who's responsible for carrying out that work? Great, Jackie says that's correct. So in your organizations, do you have someone who is focused already on um, building the level of accountability? Black Future Co-op Fund is a little bit different, but Shona, you can uh, still chime in and, and talk about from your early experience what that looks like, and I'm happy to as well, but I'll um, turn it over to you panelists to respond to Jackie's question. And thank you, Jackie. So, you know, I'm I'm just several months into my role at Seattle Foundation and kind of what I've observed quickly is I don't have one person. I think there's several people and groups that are kind of taking accountability for this. I think my focus will be how do I bring strategic alignment to all of that effort and also take burden off of staff that shouldn't be carrying things, but in the absence of a strategic leader in this space, have picked it up, right, and have played the role of holding the organization accountable. So we have um, two kind of emerging affinity groups, our Black Staff Caucus, and then our collective, which is focused on um, a broader community of folks here, which I think are incredible to help us learn lived experience through the eyes of the staff that are here, but it's also their opportunity to look at our work and what we're doing and bring a critical eye to how we thought about this in hiring, how we thought about this from a performance management standpoint, how we thought about this from an investment standpoint, right? So like, I think there is a lot of work that's building, but it's creating the space for the bi-directional learning. But again, I don't want those groups holding accountability for work that's beyond the roles that, that we hired them for, right? So I think that's the balance of that we have to figure out. We also have a diversity, equity, and inclusion um, council, which is across mix of our staff that come together and think about those issues in addition to um, a DEI director, diversity, equity, inclusion director on staff that really supports a lot of the internal um, learning and training and support that we're doing around racial equity, diversity, inclusion, all those um, efforts. 
And then I have an executive in residence who focuses in on racial equity and inclusion. That's more of my external thought leader and partner who has long been a member of this community, actually used to organize with others, protest against the Auto Foundation back in the day. So she's bringing a very <laughs> strong critical lens that I appreciate, but she's now on staff in the work really supporting us on a number of fronts. So that's what I say when I mean that, like, I got a whole array of people that deeply care about this space and are looking to hold the organization accountable. But that has been in the absence, I think, in some ways of kind of a clear focus about how do we make this uh, a formalized part of what we do beyond what staff have birthed up. I think is honoring what they have birthed, is building on that foundation and making sure the right support is in place to further that and bolster that in more meaningful ways. So that's what I'm excited about, to take it further. Um, but I think even in that story of kind of what we have, I think that is similar to other organizations and sometimes a starting path for organizations to think about how they get into that space. Um, if they can't make a single hire, what can they bring together among the existing team to start to build that accountability and that relationship internal? The Black Future Co-op Fund is a startup. so. Uh, we we just hired two staff folks, and so no, we don't have that as of yet. Um, and at the Community Foundation for Southwest Washington, it was very similar to Alicia. The staff was holding that work. Um, it was a small staff, and, and staff were very overwhelmed. And so what happens when you don't have a central person to kind of hold folks accountable and kind of manage that, that work, that body of work? Um, it you go in fits and starts. Um, you, you Things aren't consistent and things aren't aligned. And so um, it, it was not apparent uh, that we were doing that work to the broader community because we didn't really have the capacity for someone dedicated to that work and staff was trying to manage through that. Now at the San Francisco Foundation, it is a, a different entity altogether. It's um, equity center work happened well beyond this conversation of equity in philanthropy period, um, mostly because of the region that it exists in, but also because of this, the, the staff that's been a part of the foundation over the years. Um, they had a, um, a, a Koshland program that was a, a, a people of color um, leadership development uh, in philanthropy, uh, which you see in different places now in philanthropy, but um, they were one of the first to do this type of leadership development for folks of color in philanthropy in, in very specific issue areas. And so it's part of the DNA of the San Francisco Foundation, and they've recently hired um, you know, a person to do that work um, and more aligned throughout all of the departments at that foundation. But um, it was just a different experience than a Southwest Washington experience, just by nature of the community that it was that the foundation existed in. Um, but yes, you definitely need that dedicated person to kind of make sure that work is aligned across the foundation. Thank you yeah. for those. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we don't have a person per se, like the other organizations, this has been something fairly small staff. And so it's been one that we've tried to weave throughout, but we did just hire somebody who's now dedicated to education. And in that education, we have part of that three stream of education that she is responsible for is that diversity, equity, and inclusion programming to do bring in those educators to help our members understand uh, these processes and what we're talking about when we talk about AI and race and gender equity and et cetera. And so we're starting that process of educating uh, and now we have to fill the rest of it to doing all that other power work that I know I talked about earlier. Thank you for responding. And also um, thank you to the audience for your questions. Thank you for putting some of your takeaways in the chat. Again, folks have joined our conversation at different points and I would love for anyone who has joined to kind of get a glimpse of what you've learned in this conversation. So continue to put your takeaways um, in the comment section. We really appreciate it. For the panelists, we have talked um, to some great extent here about some of the challenges and solutions of black leadership and philanthropy. On an upbeat note, what are ways that you bring black joy to your work and your life? 
what inspires you, what makes you hopeful? You know, I, I love this question because this is my jam. This is my thing, right? Like this is how um, I really want to approach the work and think about this work because I think in this kind of um, robust era of really talking a lot about racial equity and inclusion, we, we talk a lot about it from a deficit frame. Like, how are we going to fix the problem? How are we going to help the people, right? Oh my God, so much is going on. Resilience, resi like all these things that have such a negative connotation to it. When it's like, again, for me, Black joy and what I imagine and think about in this work are those full, deep belly laughs. It's the community barbecue, like it's good music, it's the dancing, it's the safety to be in community with each other and others and nobody policing that, right? Like that's what I think about and hold on to when I think about why it's important for us to invest deeply in um, racial justice movements and social justice movements and the organizing work and the democracy work because we're all trying to just get to this place where we can experience this kind of joy and safety and being and not have to think about it, right? I feel like if we are successful in this work in the Seattle region, if we, if you all are successful in this work across the state of Washington with the Black Future Co-op Fund and even the Washington Women's Fund, right? Like we are creating a world where any child that is born in this place is gonna have access to that joyful future, that safe future, that whole future and the color of their skin doesn't dictate whether or not they actually are able to have that or not, right? So that's what I hold on to. And Maria, your point still lands with me so deeply even from earlier around a big part for us or folks that are driving this work, especially like black women driving this work is that we gotta stay connected to what the work is. That's what been one of my great joys about coming to this community at this point in time is that I'm getting to meet leaders of organizations. I'm just getting to be in community and not tell anybody what I do or who I am, just to experience what it's like here, right? Because it's it's that that's gonna ground me in the work on the days and I'm tired of talking about the budget and I'm tired of talking about what fund holder did what. Like we gotta remember, we gotta have that North Star and what drives us. So joy is that North Star for me and how I access it just as a member of this community and access it for my team. That's what I hold on to, to kind of, think about where we're going, but how to remember to take care of myself as a human being and all of that as well. After being in this field for 20 years, I think what gives me hope is the what I'm seeing now, the evolution, the conversations that we're actually having in philanthropy. I mean, just think 20 years ago in philanthropy, I remember sitting on panels with white older men. <laughs> and here I am today sitting on a panel with all black women. Um, it was it was really um, uncomfortable for me. And it and now we're having these conversations in space together. Uh, seeing the younger generation coming up with activism and infusing that in philanthropy really gives me joy as well. I love that we're not hiring, you know, people who are just coming from philanthropy, but we're hiring people who have been on the ground in the streets doing the work um, into philanthropy and bringing, infusing that kind of energy in an, an, an industry that wasn't, you know, didn't have that energy previously. Um, I also feel like I like to vacation. So <laughs> ample rest and vacation is like key to get getting restored and coming back, you know, with that fierce urgency and energy uh, that you need to do this work. So uh, I say the hope is definitely seeing the evolution of philanthropy over the years and seeing activism in philanthropy and then also having that rest and uh, restoration that it takes um, to actually continue to do the work effectively. I mean, yeah, I I can't imagine myself really doing much else. I, I did a bunch of things before, so actually I can't imagine it and I, that I didn't do it because being able to be part of getting my hands in there to try to make the world the world that I envision, <laughs> that's chasing dreams. All I do is chase dreams all day long and that, is amazing and I get paid to do it. That's, that's astonishing. And um, I have to embrace that as, as you were saying, at least, you know, we're about trying to make that world the place that we, that we know it can be, the ways the place that we want it to be. There's this New Yorker cartoon I talk about all the time. People are probably sick of hearing me talk about it because I can't find it. 
because I saw it years ago and it's like two people inside of a box and like Central Park is all around them and like people are but like playing volleyball and bet, you know they're dancing whatever it's having a great time and inside the box it's all dark and you just see the two eyes like the people's eyes and one of them has punched their hand through the side of the box and light is coming in and the other little voice the other little person has a little bubble and it says now look what you did I feel like we're all trying to punch through that box because mm -hmm. out there on the other side, that's the world we all want. All of us, donors, fundies, the kids who don't have what they should, all of us want that that better world, the better world for all of us. And we're not going to get there unless we're all doing it together and we're listening to all the voices. And so it's really, as you say, Shona, seeing that some of our voices are really starting to get some get louder. That's really exciting. Maybe we're punching through the walls. It's, it's, it's hopeful. It's hopeful work. It is very hopeful work. And I appreciate all of the advice. Again, I have um, great notes here and we're keeping a list of many of the takeaways that folks have shared. And I hope everyone is looking at the comment section, but some of you may be on the road and driving and listening to this like it's a good old podcast. Um, but folks have honed in on, you know, foundations must lean into community by bringing them into the conversation. And this work can be challenging. Leaders must also rest and restore. Um, there's a comment about, I um, appreciate hearing this as a community-based organization because it helps us to understand the work the foundations are doing internally. Um, another one of our attendees is grateful for so much incredible Black philanthropic leadership in our region. I agree. There are so many leaders that we know and don't know. And they also added Seattle Foundation's Black Joy and Wellness Fund is an incredible example of fueling investment in Black leadership. And I could not agree more. Um, throughout this Black Philanthropy Month, we are not only hosting two of these conversations, the next being next week. And while we're talking about Black leadership, if your question is like, that's great, but show me the money. Where are y'all investing in Black led solutions and black led organizations while well, investing in black led solutions is what next week's conversation will be all about next tuesday at noon and a brand new moderator a brand new set of panelists but we want to talk about the investment piece where is the money and how do we get access to it um so make sure that you tune in next week. But also, if you um, follow any of the named organizations or the Black Future Co-op Fund, we are making sure that we're lifting up Black philanthropic leaders and solutions um, on our social media. And so there are lots of folks, again, who are known and unknown, but there are um, some of our elders and some of our philanthropic leaders who are just unsung heroes in our community. And so we're making sure that through a digital campaign, we are recognizing their legacy, that we're educating our community um, on Black generosity. This is not a new concept. I love that Shona pointed out that what we see in philanthropy has changed over the last couple of decades, but Black folks and our generosity has been at the core of philanthropy from the beginning of time. It just wasn't at the forefront of what was seen, what was shared, it wasn't at the forefront of the philanthropic narrative. But here we are changing that narrative, putting forth a truthful Black narrative about what it means to be philanthropic and what it means to be Black in philanthropy. Um, so continue to celebrate with us and learn with us all throughout this month of August. And as we say in Black Future Co-op Fund, you know, every day is Black Philanthropy Day um, because this is the work that we do every single day. And just want to highlight one more takeaway, Black philanthropy leadership built on a movement of seeking to thrive and not just survive. So thank you for those takeaways. And before I get to my um, closing question, I do want to recognize that we have another wonderful question from one of our audience members, and it's about measurement and evaluation. So to our panelists, how do you as leaders think about measurement and evaluation in the context of community-centered philanthropy? How is impact defined from your lens? And again, any of you can, can jump in on this question. Yeah, so, you know, this is a, um, I don't, I'm not gonna call it a tricky question for me. I just think I have a certain perspective on this, right? So I've spent more of my career as a lobbyist than I have as someone that's been in philanthropy. And what, for folks that have been in that space or been in government relations or just advocacy work that you know 
a big part of understanding success in that realm is around the narrative and the progress. What movement are we making over time? We built the coalition, we pushed for that legislation, lost on the legislation, but like maybe we built a stronger coalition. So next cycle we came back and we actually got the movement, right? So like there's a there's a story about the journey that organizations take that I tend to um, lean towards and thinking about what does measurement and evaluation look like in this work, especially if community is at the center? Because I think we're trying to hold a lot of tensions of like, we wanna evaluate it and we wanna give people survey tools and know the things, but like if we're talking about grassroots organizations, organizations that have limited capacity, we're creating more burden on them to do that kind of work, right? So we have to get thoughtful about the ways that we use the process of listening and learning and building a relationship to learn what their journey has been over time that we get honest about what are the most critical things we think we need to know as funders for whatever it is that we think we need on the back end for our boards or the community or whoever else that we feel that we're accountable to in the work. But for me, I think the the central point is like, what has been their journey? What's different, you know, several years out from our initial investments that wasn't there in the beginning that can point to how they've been able to move over time. Um, but then also, what does it say then about the community that they're serving and the impact that's happening there? How's their capacity growing, right? Like, how are they getting sharper? And not just like the work itself, because I find in most experiences, I get, I've worked with community leaders who have strong vision and passion and know how to engage. They may not know how to keep a budget well, though. They may not like have the right staff, right? So we got to get honest about that conversation too. So like, how are we helping them build the operational piece and the infrastructure to support this bold, audacious vision that they have about moving in community, right? So these are components of things that I know I have always valued in before because I want to hold space to ensure that in the effort of trying to build trust-based philanthropy and be more community-centered, we're still not trying to apply old models to how we think about evaluating the work that kind of counteracts all the other things we're trying to do on the front end, right? And that's a tricky thing. I know this, right? Um, but for me, I think, again, it probably centers more in kind of the narrative and the journey of the organization. It, it's the, the base thing that I look for. My team will tell me about that because they're doing a lot of work. <laughs> I, I, I actually love that. I love that. And, and I think for when we're talking about flipping the paradigm of, of philanthropy and having it be black centered, we are a, um, I mean, we are a, a storytelling oral tradition culture and that narrative and telling those stories of growth, your starting point and where you're going, I think is, um, is useful to us in our community. Yeah. Right. And it, it's not centered in that very data centered. I want to see the outcomes, the numbers based that I think is, you know, really kind of very, there's whiteness in that, you know, like that measurement of your, your success by numbers, looking at the numbers is, is very white. It's very capitalistic. And I think the storytelling piece is the piece that I think, um, Alicia, you're talking about that I think is the most important for you know uh, black communities and other communities of color. Yeah, I, I wanted to piggyback a little bit in there because the, we've been wrestling with the same question is how do we how do we follow up after we've given out grants? How do we know that our money made a difference? Not your money. Um, the <laughs> the part that we've really been wrestling with and where we've been focusing a lot of our energies is on the relationship building uh, between individuals and within organizations. And I think, Alicia, when you're talking about like people who are really, really great at the vision, but the, the infrastructure won't help them grow, you can't know that until you get a relationship with them, mm -hmm. until you get a relationship with that organization and you're getting close enough and you're understanding how it is that they operate and seeing how you can be helpful. And that isn't really an evaluation of of the organization so much as an evaluation of you and how are you going to do more and help this organization more, perhaps even beyond dollars, but how are you gonna be able to help them with the dollars that they need when they need it? And that is that can't be known until you ask and then listen 
to the answer that you get back. And so we changed our evaluation process to just be conversations, to be those storytelling. Tell us what's happening. Tell us what's going on. Where do you need more help? How can we be more of service to you? Instead of really flipping who's being evaluated, for lack of a better term, but we we eliminated all of it. And it has been... Um, it's such a warmer experience <laughs> to have with our, our nonprofits. I mean, there are certainly things we want to be able to start maybe making sure that, that we haven't, um, you know, we, we check out these organizations ahead of time. We know whether they can do the work that they say they're going to do. We know whether or not they're already making a difference. So much of nonprofit work is just, could we get the dollars to replace the dollars that left yet last year because that donor isn't around anymore or whatever? Like we can't know what the internal workings of that is per se. And certainly we consider it a success if the organization was able to stay thriving for even another year. Like there, that year was still probably something that was better because than it was without them. Uh, we we trust that they know and that they are making an impact and they can tell us what that impact is and that we are not necessarily giving enough money to really move the needles all the time. Our organization is smaller than some of y'all's and our gifts are about $100,000 each, which sounds like a lot of money, but $100,000 does not go very far in Seattle. And so it really doesn't go very far. So, you know, being really honest and open about what are we giving to even ask for some sort of report back or impact report or evaluation. And then who and what needs to be evaluated and how can we know? We can't know until we build relationships first. So we have work to do before we get to ask. We have so much more work to do, but I feel very hopeful um, knowing the type of leadership, the, the, the caliber of black leaders who are um, in our philanthropic organization. So thank you all again. I just can't thank you enough for what you're sharing that's educating um, not only me, but the, you know, the dozens of folks who are listening in today, which reminds me as I look at um, Philanthropy Delaware, I'd love to know where folks are um, tuning in from. So if you are able to put in a chat, where are you? Are you in Washington state, a different state? If you're in Washington, what city, what county? Um, however you want to identify what neighborhood, if you're in Pierce County, you want to rep, you know, Hilltop, Fircrest. But um, if you're driving, um, yes, don't comment. You can watch it later and put it in the comments. But if you are um, seated and safe, let us know where you're listening from. And um, I have a closing question for the panelists. You've given real incredible advice. The next step for everyone here, I think, has to be action. It's really great to tune in and listen. And trust me, I'm very grateful um, for all that has been shared and heard, but for us to really change the paradigm of philanthropy, we have to take action. So in closing, will each of you please suggest an action that people can take to either support Black leadership in philanthropy or an action to create greater accountability in philanthropy to center um, and invest in the Black community? So again, just... Um, an action that you feel um, people can take as they're tuning in today? I mean, in the, just do it at the end of the day. I think that's what it comes down for me uh, to be about. It's like, just invest, right? Like, I think sometimes this comes down to courage at the end of the day, more than anything else. Um, organizations need multi-year flexible support for them to be able to have the kind of runway to do the kind of work and achieve the kind of vision and, you know, joyful future that we've been talking about. And while we can take them through a series of conversations and ask them for a bunch of documents to review and analyze this and analyze that, at some point we just got to, you know, make the bet right? Like just make the bet, make the investment, see what you learn, keep making the investment. Because when we think about entrepreneurship, that's all about calculated risk, right? We hear great ideas and we think about how we're going to invest. We have a long history in this field to where we got very comfortable doing that with certain types of organizations, but yet we struggle with others. Like we've talked about why that bias exists. So let's, let's get the courage to move past that now and just say, 
I am, as a result of this conversation, I'm going to make a big investment in the Black Future Co-op Fund and in the Washington Women's Fund because I believe in the work that they're trying to do. I'm just going to do it. Just write the check, do it, direct transfer, whatever the thing is. I know y'all got websites with links for people to go and do the thing. Like, that's the action I would encourage. It's just have the courage and take the step. Let it be flexible support. Let it be long-term support because the things that we're trying to do in this work are long-term. So the patient capital to accompany that is really important. So just do it. Yes, just do it. <laughs> and also lean in and learn, learn and amplify. If you have, if you're sitting in a, a place of privilege to amplify the stories that you're hearing and, and that you're learning, be an ally in that way and amplify those stories and, and um, those lessons that you're learning. Um, yes, beyond just giving financial support, we, I think we need to be more networked need to be closer to, you know, folks who are holding wealth um, so that we can tell them the stories of what's happening in community and get them to invest. Um, so lean in, learn and amplify what you're learning in community. I love that. Well, I was going to say give money, but then then you also. <laughs> so so I will I will underscore that because, look, we live in a capitalist society. We're going to need money to move things. That's just the way it goes. And so, uh, so give money so that we can move to that outside the box, get outside that box. Um, and I want to go back to approaching this work with curiosity as opposed to uh, that and, and not from that, that sense of, of um, questioning why people can't do things right. Really deleting into that idea that um, what do I not know? And, and, and stand in your own um, lack of knowledge, be okay with that. And then you can see new passageways or new pathways to go forward and then embrace those pathways. It really does demand courage and, um, and taking steps into places that maybe you don't know or that are different. And I encourage us all to do that, myself included, that you can go ahead and do things a little differently. And in the end, it's probably going to be okay. And uh, so I, I, I want us all to be a little braver, a little more curious, and, and give more money. <laughs> that was what I was like to <laughs> Here's to bravery, curiosity, just doing it, writing that check now. Um, I just want to thank each of you panelists. Thank you, Alicia, Maria, and Shona. Thank you for your time, for sharing your expertise and insights. I also want to make sure I say thank you to our ASL interpreters for helping us to ensure more of our community could access this rich discussion. And thank you to everyone working behind the scenes to ensure that we could have this conversation and share this space together. Thank you all, our audience, for joining. Um, I hope that you feel um, enriched by this conversation. I hope you feel um, just the high amount, the dense quantity of wisdom um, of the panelists. We would still love your feedback. We have another conversation next month, and we want to make sure that each of these conversations are providing information that you need. So give us your feedback. Please take a moment to fill out a brief survey to help us design future experiences and events tailored to your interests. We're going to put a survey, um, a link in the chat for you to complete. And we also hope that you'll join us and invite your friends and colleagues to next Tuesday's conversation on August 30th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for the fierce urgency of investing in Black communities. Um, our virtual event will explore ways to move beyond words and into action. So we'll pick up where we left off on this conversation with what do we need to do to ensure that the checks are written and the investments are made and Black-led solutions and that we continue to increase the flow of resources to Black communities. I just want to thank you so much for joining us. I hope each of you have a wonderful week and that we see you next week on Tuesday as we continue this conversation and happy Black Philanthropy Month 2022 to each of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.